Hello, and welcome to episode 7 of Critical Twit. Today we're going to be talking about Malifaux, the Victorian steampunk horror game from Weird. With cowboys. Well, yeah, that's Victorian. They existed then, just a different country. I think it was just very important to make sure people were aware there are cowboys. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that, Colin. It's not like it's taken me three attempts to start this. Um, um, so you currently find us on the train into Malifaux going through the breach. While we're uh, waiting to arrive in Malifaux, take a look around and see what it's like on the other side, we thought we'd discuss some of our favourite wargaming memories. Mm. Because... Malifaux. A, Malifaux is a war game, and B, we're old. We have a lot of memories to share. <laughs> All we have left to hold on to. In the grim, yeah. grim darkness that is our present. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, a fantasy pun. <laughs> well, one but 40k pun. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Um, who'd like to go first? Ah, uh, go on then. Go on then. Okay. Favourite war gaming memory, Aaron? Well... Oh, we didn't actually introduce ourselves. No, it's fine. People should know we are. Yeah, that's good. If not, go back, listen to all the other podcasts and try and work out which one of us is which. Yeah. yeah. Answers on a postcard. <laughs> Sorry, uh, olden times on a pigeon. So, yeah, my favourite wargaming memory um, was when I was about 13. I was just starting to get into Games Workshop and the whole Warhammer stuff. I all my Warhammer 40k things, was playing with those a little bit. But they were doing a Warhammer session one weekend when I popped in. Um, and they'll run it so everybody kind of had their own individual unit. So you had like six people aside the table, and everybody had like a unit they control for fighting other people. And I had some cavalry cavalrymen on horseback, and I was charging in, attacking everything. And all my cavalrymen were failing fucking miserably, like ones constantly. But the horses got attacks. And they were slaughtering their way through the battlefield. <laughs> so none of my men could hit hit the ship. They swing, they'd miss. But the horses, horses were well fed that day. <laughs> charged through the whole battlefield, and the horses managed to chop their way from one end of the table to the other. Oh, because really I couldn't good. figure out that I should actually be turning around, really attacking other people, and trying like side attacks and stuff. Because you know, wasn't very good at tactics back then. Mm. Straight lines, but yeah. That was quite a funny one because, uh, yeah, it was just a nice combination of absolutely awful and the best dice rolls ever. Yeah. The complete wrong things. Mine has to be a 40k game where I had the played the Tau and I was firsting an, um, an army of Tyranids. Um, this, I think, was fourth edition rules. So my troop transports all being hover vehicles. What were they called? Skirmishers? Yeah. What the hell were they called? What? <laughs> <laughs> the hovering vehicles. What the fuck were they called? They were named after fish. Just name a fish. No one will know. No, I was thinking the actual vehicle type, because it was skirmisher. They're like or... barracudas. And, yeah. Um... That was it. Um, my devil fish is... Devil fish. There um, goes a fish. Yeah. My, it's an um... evil fish, but it's a fish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my devil fishes and hammerheads built a, uh, a battle line with the tower behind them, and I was just murdering my way forward. I was actually being more aggressive than, than the Tyranid player. Um, right over on my left flank, I had a small six-man unit of men, fire warrior team, who got charged by 30 Hormigans. I managed not only to resist all 15 of their wounds against me, I then managed to kill one in response, and they were out of synapse range, and they failed their morale test and ran away. I then beat them in the distance they ran, so killed all 30 of them. By chasing them down. It was just the fact that this tiny six man unit held its ground against a combat army. Oh. Um, that always amused me. Excellent. I don't actually have one for this. What, you don't have any positive memories of wargaming? Not a Brian. single one. I no, don't... I think most of my wargaming memories have been warped by the fact that I spent seven years working for Games Workshop. Um, and the whole thing has become a, a blackened pustule on my, <laughs> on my psyche. Um, so me and Colin are uh, giving our stories away and you're like, yeah, no, I, I know shit. the horrors that were going on in the background. Do you know how hard it is to keep 12 people on track during a game? It was good, good practice for my current career. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I was just being silly then. Um, 
I have memories of a particular individual. Now, Colin, you know this particular individual. There are multiple memories taking place over the course of many years. Um, when I was, I got into to go into workshop when I was about 10 years old. Um, I saw the then second edition of Warhammer 40,000 in, uh, in Argos. Um, and um, suddenly I realised I there was a shop nearby so I went there got some stuff um, and used to go down for sort of the gaming nights once you had to be 12 I think to go at the gaming nights mm, yeah. um, at that point mm. uh, Games Workshop never really had they always had lots of rules they liked rules in their shops but they were never consistent and they never really made any sense um, but there you go um, you can paint in there no you can't paint yeah. in there buy all the paint <laughs> yes yeah um, now this particular individual uh, was a couple of years older than me he used to go into the shops he'd been about 14, 15 when I was 12, 13 um, very loud individual I'm trying, to, um, I'm trying to even imagine this person as a 15 year old and it's actually you know who it is immediately though, I know and you? it's disturbing me um, <laughs> and um, was the person who was the most into the uh, into the game the person who was um at the, the customers of that sort of age range was sort of the most vocal um, about his love for the uh, for the hobby um, and used to boss the younger kids around and tried to boss me around um, and um, I was raised to have a zero tolerance approach to bullying by my parents <laughs> um, and when this particular chap and it was it wasn't anything particularly uh, nasty to be honest looking back um, but he uh, he was trying to sort of put me down a little bit and, and get me to uh, I think go and fetch him something from somewhere and I was like no go and do it and he was like oh, you should go and fucking do it uh, blah 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 uh, to cut a long story short I kicked him square in the nuts as hard as I could <laughs> <laughs> um, mature yeah. yeah now about seven years later I became very good friends with this particular person <laughs> and about ooh, a few years after that I ended up working with this person always with the knowledge that I had physically assaulted him <laughs> to the point of him lying comatose by the painting section <laughs> tears squeezing silently out of his eyes because I'd managed to shock him to the point where he could no longer make any kind of sound <laughs> not even a whimper um, <laughs> not proud of it um, but don't pick on people Especially was, people that are smaller than you. I've always been smaller than everyone, so... <laughs> I don't know. I think I grew up with a massive chip on my shoulder. Short person syndrome, they call yeah. that, Brian. Now, this particular person um, was also <laughs> notorious. Um, when Warhammer 40,000 moved into a sort of the third... I think it's third edition. Uh, the Eldar Harlequin army was renowned for being incredibly beardy or cheesy or broken yeah uh, really nasty uh, really hard to beat um, and was playing this same guy was playing against one of these armies and grew so outraged what did you do Colin were you there I wasn't there but uh, I've, I've heard the story I just thought I'd involve someone else <laughs> he uh, from what I heard um, he picked up this person's Harlequin model that was yep. doing a devastating amount of damage to his army, yep. and he ate it. <laughs> Literally picked up the white metal model, yep. put it in his mouth, chewed it, and swallowed. Yeah. A white metal... Lead is really poisonous. White yeah. metal won't do you any lasting damage, but it's not great for you. I, I wouldn't eat large <laughs> quantities of it. Um... Yeah, he didn't actually swallow it, he'd spit it back oh, out, he did. but the local legend became, <laughs> yeah, he uh, ate this model. Um, now, years later, I was uh, a fellow staff member at the same shop with the same guy, and we were playing a game of uh, Warhammer Fantasy um, after hours as part of our staff tournament that we were playing to relax, have fun, <laughs> renew our love of the hobby. Um, chap really liked knights and such like he'd never really played fantasy he was more into 40k yeah. I dabbled with with both um, and so the guy was into his knights and such like so he'd taken a Bretonian army mm -hmm. I think it was the closest thing he could find to space marines because he wasn't really a big fantasy player he was really into yeah. Warhammer 40,000 Sorry, was it Bretonian or Fortnite? Bretonian army. I thought yeah. it was just an Imperial army he had. He, his, he had a Bretonian army because he had all these nice knights all lined up in that one. Oh, yes, he formation. did. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and I was playing Wood Elves um, and I had a thousand point army um, of Wood Elves, which back in those days wasn't a lot. A typical army was about 2,000. Yeah. Um, so I had my thousand point army. I had 17 models 
All Ooh. Toughness 3, which is rubbish. Yeah. All Single Wound, apart from one character, which was rubbish. Yeah. I don't think I had an armour save in the entire army. But what I did have was a shed load of things that infiltrated. So he started off on the other side of the board. I then deployed right next to him <laughs> in the woods. Because that's what you do. Yeah, well, I was a wood elf. Yeah. I'd be upset if a wood elf Yeah, mm, With my way watchers with their armour piercing and all sorts of other nasty things. Got first turn, shot at quite a few of his knights, killed a couple of people. Um, and then he wheeled his knights around and charged into the forests after me. <laughs> <laughs> was he hoping he'd played lumberjacks when they were going to chop their way through? <laughs> I obviously ran away. <laughs> and... Um, the entire game it was over by the fourth turn as his knights ran into trees um, and got nowhere I don't think he even got halfway across the board and I just slaughtered him uh, using tree magic <laughs> uh, that's the technical term and um, shooting him because trees don't um, you can see through trees as a wood elf yeah. as if they were not, not even there. there essentially you can't see to the other side but we had a big wood down the side of the uh, the thing um, and the guy became so enraged that he threw his brand new army across the shop and stomped out on our <laughs> nice happy gaming night um, and then swore blind that that didn't happen but it did I was there I saw you um, and yeah I, 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 news. I've been uh, I've been made angry by games <laughs> in the past like when we played Twilight Imperium and I wanted to die for the first four and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. The second four and a half hours flew by. It was great. That sounded sarcastic. It's not. It was good. <laughs> I was made sad by a pair of Terminators once. Yeah? Terminators? Yeah, Terminator. Right? Arnie and Robert yeah. Pratt. Oh, yeah. Patrick. No, my, my five man... <laughs> it started off really well. My five man unit of um, Terminators or with um, shields and thunder hammers hmm. took... I think it was. I think we were added it up because it was one of those miraculous moments. I took it. I think it took about fourteen hundred points of shooting, and not a single one fell. Pretty much his entire turn because they dropped right next to his army, yeah. and he shot his entire army at them, and they just stood there and laughed. And I went, "Good guys, good lads." Charged them in. They strike last because they've got thunder hammers. Yep. He caused two wounds. Just like in real life. Yes. Yeah. Um, he caused two wounds and I then proceeded to roll a double one. <laughs> For my armour save. Immediately dropping two of them on the floor dead. I lost the combat and the rest got chased down and died. For those of us not versed in uh, Warhammer 40,000, what did you need to survive? A two or more on uh, a six-sided dice. I remember when they had a three-plus save on 2d6. Good lord. Yeah. Oh, yes. that's showing yes. rage. Yes. Back when I was young and GCSEs were hard. <laughs> Another story from what I do remember of... Don't um, believe that for a second, by the way. This particular character he used to play 40k with, um, <laughs> Brian, however, was the time where I decided to play him. We lined our armies up across the board, and then he proceeded to try and tell me that my army didn't have any guns. Because in the rule book, the guns were called bulk guns, and yet under the armour inventory um, for all the characters, it said they were armed with bolters, and bolters therefore didn't have a rule, and therefore did not exist in the game. Yeah. What? I then wrote into the rule book that bolters were AP10, oh no, were AP1 strength 10, <laughs> and hit everything on a 1 plus, just to wind him up. Yeah. So we had a bit of an argument about that. that. Yeah. Pedantry. Yeah. Like, Oops. Remember when uh, the Necrons, so like the, the actual like Terminator like ones. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When they first came out, were they the Immortals? Right. Yes. Yeah. My neighbour got them, and I went around to test them out. So I brought my Terminator up, like the Terminator squad versus his little small Necron squad, yeah. as a tester thing. Um, I managed to kill two of them off fairly quickly. I went, oh, they're not too bad. That's all right. Walked my Terminators past them, and then he proceeded to roll. No, I killed three of them. And then he proceeded to roll the dice, and because they resurrect, yeah. Well, at least at the time they, yeah, they get back up, yeah. After a certain amount of time, and he proceeded to roll three sixes and have them all stand back up right behind my terminator, <laughs> and they get to act straight away after that as well. The time that was massively fucking broken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Now the reason I bring that up is that I played dozens of games against this particular person. Um, most of which were enjoyable, some of which were surreal, um, <laughs> one of which was incredibly awkward. Um, and the thing I, I just want to say about wargaming is the thing I, I remember most isn't that I rolled a six at this point or um, 
this happened or that happened in the game, it's the people. Yeah. I think it's the same with any kind of game, yes. especially board games, role-playing games, uh, war games, that you can play a slightly dodgy war game with a good friend and have a laugh. Yeah. You can play the best war game in the world if you're playing against someone who is a horrible, picky, rules-lawyering, horrible person, then you're going to have a bad time. Yeah. Even if the game itself is really good. In fact, probably the better the game, the more annoyed you're going to be by someone uh, picking holes in it or making it a non-fun experience. Yeah, thinking yeah. about it, my um, my most favoured memory with the first in the tear and Eds, it was against someone who was a great laugh to play against, and we yeah. ended up pissing ourselves laughing for about ten minutes when I managed to defeat his hormones. But yeah. yeah, if that had been a very picky person to play... Or a very annoying person to play, it wouldn't have been half as enjoyable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I've just thought that actually of my, probably my half a dozen closest male friends at least, I know five out of the six from my days at Games Workshop, either as a customer or when I was working there yeah. later on. It's just you, Aaron, that, that doesn't. Yes. <laughs> I, I was actually thinking the same <laughs> thing. It is only yeah. Aaron. Yep. Yeah. Who doesn't take part in that little group? Right? So, as much as I don't play Games Workshop anymore, uh, I haven't touched it for quite some time. Many uh, years now, it seems. It's still got a bit of a sweet spot for it because of well, it how it's affected my life. Yes, yeah. and it introduced that hobby element. Yes, And definitely. how many of the other hobbies that we've got into... How many wouldn't we have got into if it wasn't yeah. for GW? I, mean, I wouldn't have role-played. Because I wouldn't have met you guys. And yes. I wouldn't have ended up role-playing. So it was a welcoming environment when... Yes. We were at Lens. Um, <laughs> you know, I it, was was sort of, it was a nice central place to go that, considering it was something that wasn't necessarily socially acceptable, um, you know... Yes, yes. Mother would with. give me three shiny sixpences and I could buy, <laughs> I could buy a whole paint... A paintbrush and a four thousand point Necron army with my three shiny sixpence. It's more than you could buy now. Well, exactly. Oh, it's not the same as it was in my day. It's a lot more expensive. I'll give them that. Yeah, but yes, it's the same. Anyway. Same thing for me. I was a lot younger. Being geeky wasn't socially acceptable yeah. Yeah. really at school, and, and yeah. so I found a place that was it was yeah, and that was nice. Yeah, and so it was a very long way round for me to say that just to introduce the idea. We've not really talked about many war games before. No, no, we haven't touched um, it much. But I have a, a huge soft spot for them. I've been playing them for over twenty years. Oh, I've just done the maths <laughs> with an S, and it's got to hurt. Oh, yeah. that, that's made me sad a little. <laughs> I'm very luckily only at 14 years. I'm not even bothering to do the maths. It's <laughs> making me sad. <laughs> okay. Um, we've almost arrived at uh, Malif Malifaux. We've gone through the breach, uh, which is in Malifaux there is a parallel world next to ours that can be accessed through breaches in kind of space-time. Um, and on the other side, um, basically, are lots and lots of extra-dimensional horrors but also lovely things called soul stones that power magic. So Ooh. it takes place in a kind of alt alternate history, alternate reality. Yeah. Uh, where when the breach happened, magic flooded into our world through the soul stones and sort of seeped out. Um, so it's I think it's in the early 1900s now. That's kind of the current yeah. mode, but it's got yeah, sort of the... steampunk technology and things that maybe seem a little bit more modern. There's sort of animated robots and things as well as yeah. um, as well as your traditional steampunk gubbins and and cowboys, Colin. And cowboys. Talk, there's a heavy Thank wild you. west theme to to some of it. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of the extra dimensional horrors also they've got that kind of horror feel. And we'll get more into that in a in a second. What I'm really disappointed though is that as we stand here um, at the station in Malifaux, none of us developed any powers. No. What happens to a lot of people when they travel in them? to Malifaux is that they sort of become awakened their dormant magic abilities awaken yeah Colin what would you have liked as a power to, yeah what power would you like to have developed I would have liked the power of it hmm now I've got to think because I had one and then it's gone by our talk of, of, of life <laughs> I thought you were going to say the power of ignorance for a minute <laughs> the power of ignorance <laughs> 
I would like the power to get a comfortable sleep wherever I was. <laughs> no matter where I lay down, it would instantly be comfortable. So you would become the avatar of napping comfortably. I would. <laughs> I would. Why? Why? <laughs> Is this because you've been commuting again? I just really like sleeping. <laughs> yes, we noticed. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to we tried to arrange this much earlier in the day, and yeah. Colin was asleep. I was till when? I was asleep for seventeen hours <laughs> until three o'clock in the afternoon. See, I knew you as a teenager. Yeah, and you never used to be like this. Now no. that you're old, <laughs> you've got the sleeping habits of a teenager. It's like you're trying to catch up on. Yeah, I've never slept as a teenager. No, you're now. always wired and slightly wild-eyed. Yeah, and now I've suddenly gone out and sleeping. <gasps> Drugs are bad. <laughs> <laughs> All good in my yes. case. I took loads of drugs as a teenager and I was fine. <laughs> now I don't take any and I'm really tired. <laughs> in Malifaux, a lot of the um, the more powerful characters are they can have an avatar form. It's why I called you the avatar of napping comfortably. Um, they tend to be sort of the embodiment of concepts. You have the uh, the avatar of December who uh, uses freezing magic and is cold and uncaring. You've got the avatar of fire who. Uh, Sets things on fire. Uh, the Herald of ob- of um, Obliteration, um, <laughs> who we've spoken about before, yes, um, who destroys things utterly to the point they didn't exist. So then time travel and things get involved, and you can jump around, uh, messing around with stuff like that. Mm. I would quite like to be the Avatar of Regret. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to play a game where. Even if I lost, the other person felt so bad for beating me um, that they vowed for it never to happen again. Because <laughs> you couldn't lose. And that would be absolutely brilliant. Yeah. But what happens if they lost? Would they regret losing so much that they vow it would never happen again? They'd fall to their knees and demand vengeance. What if they bought yeah. you a birthday present? Would they then regret buying you a birthday present and vow that it would never happen? Oh, so it's the avatar happen. of regret. This is kind of, you know, all or nothing with this. Would your now, girl- you may, you the know. avatar of fire is almost always on fire. Yeah. Would your girlfriend regret spending <laughs> all these years with you and immediately move out? Well, I, I'm regretting having said this because I thought it'd be quite funny. Um, it is. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have an aura of regret. I would have the power of regret. No, I don't think you should. The Herald of Obliteration <laughs> has not been obliterated because otherwise there would be no Herald of Obliteration. <laughs> no, but she does obliterate everything around her. Not indiscriminately. Otherwise it'd just be pointless. I still prefer the idea of you like turning up to work and they go, we really regret giving you this job. So, but shut up, move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it fits quite nicely into why I want to be the avatar of Sean Fraud. So, well, now I feel bad for I quite enjoy Brian all this humiliation. I regret being mean to Brian. <laughs> yes, it so works. <laughs> Aaron's going to have to say his again because you talked over him. I'm sorry. <laughs> See, regret it. <laughs> Colin, just have a just have a nap, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the avatar of Schadenfreude. How would your yeah. powers work in the game? In the, oh, in the game itself. <laughs> yeah, okay. why not? Try and fit it in with the game instead. Or okay. in real life, go on. No, no, life. we'll do it with the game because it's probably easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when I mentioned it earlier, is a sort of giggle. <laughs> we got quite into it. What was it we're saying? Like, you, if we flipped and it didn't work for me, then I would take the other person's flip. Yeah, so if they did really well and you did badly, you could swap it over and then you could laugh at them. Yeah. So yeah, you'd have all sorts of misfortunes. Yeah. So the worst I played. The, the or you'd have a special one. ability that if you got it Which off... Which fits quite well. If they win the game, they actually lose. <laughs> 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 a bit like uh, that. Are we a dual faction then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah, we, no, we team up quite well. Yeah. We? yeah. yeah. Excellent. <laughs> The reason that we're starting with Manifo, we've been playing Manifo for oh, just under a year, sort of February time. Yes. So ooh, nine months. Yeah. Yeah. We actually, aware though. of his ex- existence for the last couple of years. Yes. We've been tempted. The models look really, really nice. Yes. And then they re-released everything in plastic, and they look ten times nicer. Yeah. The plastic models are very, very lovely. Oh, the reason so. we've decided to, to talk about it today is because they've just released a brand new starter box, yes. uh, which consists of two uh, different sides. They're called factions in Malifo. I think there's six altogether. Yeah. Uh, you get uh, four models for the guild, who are kind of like the humans, 
uh, a big corporation, yeah. essentially. And you've got four models for the Neverborn, who are the natives of Malifaux, the weird creatures uh, that live on the other side of the uh, breach that are trying oh, okay. to drive people out. Um, quite often they're shaped by the... See? It's quite good, isn't it? It's yeah, quite yeah. interesting. Um, they're shaped by the psyches of people around them, so they often take the form of things that people are scared of. Yeah. Hence why they kind of get that horror side Alarm of things. clocks. No! <laughs> <laughs> Deadline. Com- the commitment monster! <laughs> <laughs> No, that's too real, isn't it? It's too real. Uh, just a just a little just a little model just carrying the sack of cash that I would have had I not spent all my money on Malifaux models. Yeah, which I have done. Um, yeah, so um, that's only just came out. Um, it was re- it was sort of released at Gen Con. Uh, one of the things I will say about Malifaux. Um, and I have really enjoyed playing Malifaux. And we'll get more into our personal things in a second. Is that um, Weird is still quite a small company. Yeah. And there can be supply line issues, especially with getting things to the UK. Yes. Where so, are they based? Are they. Uh, America? That's about as much as I could tell you. It is America, but where. Yeah, that's... Insert place here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was curious because I know we've had like um, proper shipping issues, like this, the actual ships just haven't come across. Yeah, before. yeah. That was a. There was a. I mean, there was a big board game shortage of printing stuff and things like. Probably that. first world yeah. problems and all. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People are getting blown up. Suck it up. Um, but it can just be a little bit tricky to to get hold of some of the stuff over here. So although the starter box has been out for two months, I've only just had mine received yeah i've only just got it um cracked it open stuck it together and i let you two who have played a lot less malifaux than me yeah uh have a go with it yeah what did you think really enjoyed it yeah, yeah. The, the box thoroughly enjoyed it seemed the models in the box were lovely yes given that they were very very nice yeah you've got um basically the guild side are doc as a doctor a nurse and two orderlies from an asylum yeah and then you've got two Neverborn creatures that they've captured that they're sort of experimenting on and yeah. playing around with and keeping locked up. Uh, there's a little story in there that they've escaped, yeah. and then there's two other creatures that come to bust them out to stop yeah. people finding out about them. That's the last thing I really liked about it as well. Oh. I mean, I played enough games so we could we ended up skipping a good chunk of the initial yeah, game yeah. and stuff like that because we knew those mechanics. But yeah. as an introductory thing, it's like it's a little bit of story. Now you set up and play this game. Okay, you're in the corridor. You two are having a fight trying to get out. There's this Neverborn trying to get out of the cell. Yeah. It shows you the fire mechanics. And then it spreads on to it releasing another one and the orderlies chasing after them. So now you're trying to you get control of movement as well. There's oh, a bit okay. of the chasing of things. It's just each bit's escalating until we play the game we played. Yeah. Where well, the rescuers have turned up as well and you're trying to properly find them That's the thing yeah. with the Malifaux game. It's very story-driven. Um, yeah. The rule book, there is a large part dedicated to campaign games and story-based games that are supposed to all link into one another. Yeah, all the different sections in the main rule book are all introduced by a story. Yeah. Um, and they've been advancing the plot as they've gone through. So you can actually go back to the old books and start things from the beginning where you can sort of dive in. You don't... It's not actually that bad to dive in in the middle. I've found I've not no. gone back. No, uh, but there is there are stories for each of the uh, the main characters yeah. um, in the game, um, which is quite nice. And I yeah. like that they carried that on um, into the um, into the starter box. Yeah. They've got the little handwritten notes uh, yeah. from one of the characters, yeah, the, the doctor, the doctor, doctor it, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, so. Yeah. It built the rules up as you went along? Yes. Yeah. Now, I've played a couple of games before now. Mm. Um, and it said she went in the deep end, if we're going to take the star box, as the, the shallow end, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Like the paddling pool. Yeah. Adjacent to the swimming pool and full of monsters that is Malifaux. There's a lot to take on board. Yes. A hell of a lot to take on board. Which was daunting. Yeah, it's, it's very not, daunting. Uh, for those of you that have played any of the GW games, it's not move, shoot, charge, move, shoot, charge, move, shoot, charge. It's, yes. It's a lot more common. There's, you get powers and tactical actions that each character can do. So yeah, there I is mean, the moving and shooting, but 
you could do a double move, or you could just do two combat attacks, or you could do a combat action, and, and then you've got interact actions, and yeah. oh god, it, yeah, it, just... it can stack up when you've got, yeah. especially in a bigger game, when you've got eight, nine, ten models, which might not seem a lot, but when those got individual yeah, special those, tactics, yeah, ten a... models can all do ten different things. I, I suppose technically it's more of a skirmish game than a war game. Yes, but yes. I, I don't draw any difference between the say, it's models fighting. Well, yeah, yeah, it's um, just the size, and just the, the scale. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, but um, the big thing that I really liked about this star set is um, the problem me and Colin mentioned it as well has when we were playing these large games was trying to figure out the I can't remember the name of the rule now uh, the difference between your to hit scores in essence oh yeah the um, there's a rule the, the the strong the more you beat someone oh god we're going to need to explain more we should probably explain that it so the, uh, basically you, you add when, when you attack you add a number that you flip from a deck of cards onto your attack stat. The other person does the same with the stat that they're defending with, yeah. which is normally defence, but it could be like their willpower if they're being magically manipulated. Yeah. And then <clears throat> the more that you beat them by, the stronger your attack has been. Yeah. So you get bonus cards or, yeah. um, or when, you, when you see which damage you get, or you get negative cards. So you might, if you only just hit them... You might have to flip three cards and pick the lowest one to determine how much damage, how much you damage do. you've done. In in essence, that's how it works. Yes, yeah, yeah. And <coughs> couldn't grip my head around that at all. No, I would no. rely on the other player. I mean, you yeah. said the same thing as well. Oh, I, yeah, just... I didn't understand it at all. I, and, a hit is a hit, as far as I could yeah. work out. And you've read the rule book, Colin. And I've read the rule book. Yeah. and yeah. I didn't get it. And start set came with a simple little card detailing the de- of what you had to do with that section. It introduced it in the booklet really simply. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, it didn't over complicate that. It just, this happens and then this. And it's very clear what was going on. And so it all made sense. Yeah. Clear, yeah. perfect sense. I was, I, yeah. yeah. The mo- it's, moment a brilliant, I... it's a brilliantly beautiful mechanic, in fact. So I really like yeah, it. The yeah. The moment yeah, I read that really card, nice. I went, <coughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. So I should be doing this so that this person hasn't hit, been hit as yeah. hard, which means that I take less damage, which means this. Oh, okay. It's yeah. all really tactical now and clever. Rather than me just going, oh, what, yeah. what am I doing? This this is the thing that I really liked about the Star Box. Is that, I mean, I've said to you guys before, I mean, I haven't bought any Malifaux models myself because I wasn't sure whether I liked it or not. You didn't and want I could, to regret your purchase. Yes. <gasps> and I couldn't put my finger on why. Each of the mechanics I really liked. Maybe yeah. you should you have use, a sleep on it. Yes. <laughs> Instead of... Um, Rolling a dice like you would do in many other war games, war machine games, workshop stuff like that. Yeah, it's pretty much a roll a dice. So you've got a stat, you roll a dice, you add that number against somebody else's number normally. Or you give it, it gives you a target. So you're ballistic skill three, which means you need a four. Yes. Like in real life. This has similar, similar tactics. You're trying to cast a spell. So you've got a casting skill of six, but you need a target number of 14. So you need to get eight more from somewhere. Yes. Which you get from a nice little deck of cards. So you yeah. flip the top card of the deck over, you add that number on, if you beat the top, reach will beat the number, you succeed. Except you've got a nice hand of cards that you draw <laughs> yeah. at the start of every turn as well, which, it's your... with, with exception to certain circumstances, you can then cheat fate, because it's your fate deck, yeah. and cheat that card in. It's like, okay, yes. I'm not going to succeed at that. No, I am. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. So you get a bit more flexibility with it. Yeah. Unlike a dice roll, you've got, as you start discarding cards, you can see, oh, I've used, as in the game we played, it's like um, Colin was defending against me ridiculously well, pit drawing over out the deck 12s, 11s, and 30, and 13s, you know, king, the kings and stuff yeah. like that, uh, the face cards, and stopping at any chance of me getting any hits against them. Yeah. But he then knew when he had to do his next turn, the likelihood of him getting any decent numbers out of that was a lot yeah. less because he'd drawn all the best yeah. of them already trying to stop me. Yeah. So you've got a bit of an idea, yeah. whereas in normal war gaming, it's like you're taking your best chances at all times. Yeah. Because you take a lot yeah. less risks, whereas this kind of encourages you to take the occasional very risky move. Because you know you've got that 13 in your hand and you could drop that down and it would be very unlikely. Yeah. yeah. I find there's a lot less knowing what's going to happen um, take for example War Machine if anybody's played War Machine who's listening um, it has a mechanic where you have your attack value they have their defensive value and you roll 
two, three, four dice, depending on the character and, and different mechanics. Um, and the point is to aim for their defensive number. So say you've got an attack of seven, they've got a defense of 14. On average, you'd need a seven on two dice. Well, you know the average, most people that play war games will know that the average dice roll on two dice is seven. Um, so you can sit there and work out and go, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this. Okay, that's all average dice, and there's things I can do to make them better. Yeah. Whereas in Malifaux, I'm going, right, I need to do this, so I need, a, I don't know, a ten to pull it off to hit that person, but then they could pull a card that's even higher than mine, and I have... I have, they've got 52 guards, I've got 52 guards, and God knows what both of us are going to pull. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of... It's almost like a little game of poker, yeah. where... I mean, I, I've played games where I've, I've sat there, um, I've got my six cards in front of me, and I've needed to not get to not get hit, I've needed to, to cheat in a 10 or an 11, and I've gone, oh, no, I can't do that. Yeah. And my opponent's gone, ah, excellent. So next time, when they cheat in a card, they don't put anything because they just make it, say, 10 or 11 higher, yeah. knowing that I can't do that. And then I've gone, ha-ha, no, I didn't want you to do that one, and put down the 13 that I've had in my hand all along. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's some element of sort of bluffing. Yeah. There's more control. When you roll your dice in a game, yes, you do things in the game to make those the likelihood even less. Yeah. You play spreadsheets. Failing. Yeah, a little bit. The thing is you can't change... The app what you roll, yeah. yeah. Uh, you might have re-rolls, which double your chances of succeeding. Yeah. You might have, um, you know, in War Machine, you get around behind someone, it gives you a plus two bonus to, to hit them, which is, you know, when you're rolling two dice, plus two is quite good. Yep. Um, um, but in this, you've got that control in your hand. And if you're clever, you can let certain things go. The temptation when we first started was just to keep cheating fate until we ran out of good cards. Yeah. Now, having played quite a few more games, it's yeah, like, the bigger ones. well, I want to do this and I want to do that. And it might be, oh, well, I need that model definitely to, to win me the game. Therefore, I'm going to use my high card to keep it alive or I'm saving yeah. this yeah. Uh, this red joker, which is the best card in the game, for that particular moment when I really want to strike. And you, you can plan your turn and react and there's certain models that let you draw more cards. Yeah. Um, there's certain models that make your opponent discard cards uh, or and certain models that work better depending on if you or your opponent has more or less cards. Yeah. So it's quite nicely integrated into the game as a whole. And I yeah. really, really like it. Completely changes the feel of the game. Yeah. The other thing that really changes the feel of the game for me, and you touched on it a minute ago, Colin, is that rather than one person activating their entire army, then yeah. the other person activating their entire army, um, which is how most games work and have worked for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, in If I was playing Aaron, we'd flip a card to see who went first. Let's say I went first. I would activate one model do everything I wanted to do for that turn with that model and then Aaron would activate a model yep. and do that model and then it would be my turn and I'd pick and choose Yeah, um, we'd go back and forth activating a model each Yeah, that coupled with the fact that even when it's my go if I attack Aaron's model he has to flip a card for its defence so even on the other person's turn you're still engaged yep. you're yep. still doing stuff means that for me Malifaux is much more interesting than a lot of war games where oh, yeah. your opponent's movement phase you wander off and scratch yourself in a corner somewhere <laughs> yeah. because well, there's nothing to it's do it's really dull responsive as well yeah. um, in say War Machine which you activate characters individually but you do them all all of your characters yeah. in your yeah. turn so you move a unit and then you attack with that unit and then that that's that done but then you then activate your next unit so you can just wander off for 20 minutes have a sandwich possibly catch up on some Netflix yeah. have a cigarette come back mark some damage go away yeah um, and there's nothing you can do you can't stop that person doing anything yeah but you can see what they're about to do and you go right you're doing that to do that to do that to move this character here and I can't stop you because it's your go whereas in Malifaux you go oh they okay they've moved this person here I think they're going to move this person here next time. So I'm going to move one of my characters over here. Ha ha, I've blocked you. Yeah. yeah. And so there's a lot more staring at, looking at what other people are currently doing. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. It's much more chaotic. The situation on the battlefield changes yes. much more regularly. 
um, in the bigger war games when you're taking a turn each you look at what your opponent has done you yeah. make your plan then you spend the next half an hour doing making that, that yeah. plan work in, in Malifo you have your five minutes of doing your thing well two minutes quite often you do yeah. your little thing even less than that I'd say if we, when and then, we get used to it yeah and then your opponent goes and by the time they finish their go you've been paying attention you've been involved because you've been flicking cards flipping cards for your defending and such like yeah but maybe they've changed the plan. Maybe they've killed that model that's yet to activate. Maybe they've yeah. taken the objective and are standing in the way and you didn't realise that their model could move that quickly because they've used yeah. some kind of special ability. Um, so everything's changing much more often. Um, and I like that. It keeps me much more engaged. I'm yeah. thinking a lot more. I'm not, I'm not waiting for my go. I'm constantly involved. There's far more flow the whole thing yes yes and it feels more like I've never been in a in a battle been in a couple of fights when I've been in a battle but you would see you would see it's my impression of a battle would be that it would be quite chaotic it would be yeah. hard to control uh, yes mass Maybe. tactics are very difficult to coordinate yeah and it has that feel to it something strange will happen yeah you will mess up you will flip the black joker the worst card in the game which you then can't correct that mistake it yeah. always stops you yeah. and your key thing hasn't worked but you've still got four models left to move and suddenly you're scrambling and you're thinking of a new plan whereas I feel like in, in a bigger war game if that doesn't work That's like it. War Machine oh god um, is nearly always yes it has objectives and you can do other things but generally uh, the way I've seen War Machine played um, is that everyone just tries to kill the opponent's yeah, leader. I've, I've pretty much won. Mm. All bar one, I've won every single game of War Machine that way, and I've, yes. I've probably played a good hundred games by now. Yeah, yes, the time. And yeah, I, yeah. Um, and if you go for that assassination run, as they call it, and it doesn't work, well, you're probably using your model. You probably lost and died. Yeah, you're, well, you're, you can't yeah. correct it. You can't no. change it. But I mean, especially because, with my army, which is. An assassination army. It's yeah. built to be an assassination army yeah. because that's what they are. And I've always gone, right, I'm going to charge you. If, if this messes up, I say it's game over. Yeah. Because you're just going to turn around and murder me next turn. There's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. It was the same with, I mean, I, was, I played with a Kador army uh, yeah. for War Machine, which are very defence heavy and slow I charging. I you, did yeah. yeah. Because I very barely pulled it off and managed to kill you yeah but I was in the full knowledge that if that failed that was it you yeah. were just going to turn around and beat me yeah. to death and I had exactly the same thing yeah. you know the rest of my army wasn't going to move forward yeah. quickly enough to start competing for the victory points of holding the yeah. middle I think is what we had in the most games or whatever to it, to no, be honest, but yeah. and I had one model my leader who could do the assassinate thing basically so yeah. it was a matter of just get them in front but again if that failed which it, yeah. I never got a chance to pull it off but if yeah. that failed that's it you'd have been yeah. exposed and died because there's no way of getting anything else yeah. protected yeah. I mean the, the other thing with, with it is that in um, in a game like War Machine or um, 40k or Fantasy um, it might be actually that you do something crazy with some with with a model to um, say in, in uh, War Machine you'll get something in behind the enemy line to knock over their main character. Yeah. Once something's knocked over in that game, it's really easy to hurt. Yeah. At yeah. which point you might have a gun line that shoots it to pieces. Yeah. For instance. Yeah. Now. Is it realistic that an entire army would wait for one guy to fly over the top of someone's head, over 20 other guys' heads, trip them over, and then shoot them? No. Yeah. Um, no, but you can coordinate attacks in that way. In Malifaux, I, I tried it against you with Von Schill, who can teleport through cover. Yeah. I can sort of blink in and out of uh, existence. <laughs> you thought you were safe behind a wall. Yeah. I charged you unexpectedly. Read your rule book, Colin. Uh, <laughs> And um, I, I charged you unexpectedly, nearly killed your leader. Yeah. And then you got to react. <laughs> yeah. So I couldn't just immediately use everyone else just to finish him off, yeah. throw everything at him. <clears throat> yeah. Because then suddenly your big nasty thing came and smacked my guy in the face and suddenly he was bitches from death. death. Yeah. Yeah. At which point my plan then became, how can I get him out of there before he dies? Not, yeah. oh, I get to kill everyone with that, yes. that thing. Yes, I've got one person so, in. Oh, I've won. It's, you I've can, jumped someone in, but now... He didn't die. I'm in trouble. You can both yeah. punish mistakes quick, more quickly, like in that case. But you can also 
it's a bit more generous in that you still get a chance to try and drag something back. Yeah. It just has a completely different feel because you're going back and forth. Yes. It feels more more like a rather chaotic game of chess. Yeah. Where you're thinking, trying to think three moves well, ahead quite often. If I'm going to do this, but then they're going to do that. Yeah. So if I come round, you know, you're trying to do, you're trying with, to plan with the mechanic doing. that you're flipping cards for your defence. So they're trying to hit your defence value plus what you flipped and you're trying to flip against their attack value and what they flipped it's far more it makes yeah it, it makes it more flowing because you're flipping it yeah you're yeah. flipping the cards you're defending against yourself instead of going okay he's charged against my person yeah I cast this spell this turn that gives him plus two defence but I can't physically do anything no, to stop him you shout numbers of people I, he's uh, yeah he needs. I've just got to tell him he needs a ten to hit me. Instead, I'm going. I can flip cards, and I can cheat the card in to stop him hitting me. And I can do this, and I can do that. Yeah. Or oh, if I pull it. Oh, I pulled him into combat now. If I can keep him alive, I pinned him, and then all my other stuff can start jumping on him. That's, yeah, that's awesome. So, for instance, your McMorning box. So McMorning is a crazy doctor who uh, performs autopsies and secretly in the dead of night makes the dead rise again yeah he's got lots of people that can hand out that can slow people down and then if you slow them twice they get paralyzed yeah then you have another model in your um box in your box that can swallow a paralyzed model whole yeah so you've got a lot of what it does is these these combinations but your opponent gets a chance to react to them if you paralyze something you might go oh my god if that gets over there it's going to eat him yeah therefore I need to get in there. I need to. Um, I need to stop him. So you might throw a cheap model in the way of the thing of the Frankenstein's monster that eats people uh, to stop it. Yeah. So you've got these nice combinations, and you can kind of suddenly realise what your opponent's trying to do. Yeah. And try to to undo it. So it's got that kind of frantic feel to it that I don't get from any other war game. No. Actually, I would say. It's, this isn't a problem with the game, but it definitely would put me off if I was playing an experienced player. Um, because it really does help to know what everybody else's stuff does. Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, the game... When I said you needed to read the rule book for Von Schell, I was having my tongue firmly in my cheek. Yes, um, um, but it's something that I... My entire plan is I set myself up in a, a little L-shaped corner. There was there was high walls, um, only one opening, and I put my big heavy Frankenstein's monster there and went, he'll just smash against me. And then I can do all these bits and pieces, and him flying through the wall at me, I should have seen that coming. Mm. Now, the game is quite good. It does state that you can read the other opponent's cards. And in the rule books, if you've got all the rule books, you've got all of all the, the cards, factions. all of the models, the cards are printed in the book. Yeah. Uh, which is nice. So, so you so can learn everything that happens. Yeah, it's uh, not everything like, that everybody does. It's not like you've got a segregated codex. Yeah. For instance, Warhammer 40,000, I'm looking at you in disgust. Yeah. Um, you've got access to all that information, but there's a lot of information to yes. take on. There's a cu good couple hundred different types of model yep. uh, out there now. And that's what I'd say would be the one problem if you were playing an experienced player. He's going to sit there and he spent the last couple of years playing and roughly knows what most things do. As a new player, it's going to be frustrating if you're playing somebody that knows what's going on and you're going, well, like, I haven't... I've only just learned what my stuff can do, let alone what all your stuff can do, and you know what my stuff does, so you, you've just counteracted it. Mm. But we haven't had that problem because we're all we've all roughly started at the same time. Some of us have read more of the book than others. Yeah, but that's fine. Yeah. So um, we were talking about assassination runs in War Machine. Yes. And one of the things I really like about Malifaux. I know that your mileage has varied in our sort of pre-podcast yeah. discussions. Uh, I think it'd be interesting for us to talk about is that there is no victory condition. There's no instant win victory condition. No. Yeah, there, you can't wipe an opponent's army out and win automatically, which sometimes happens. Yeah, and you can't definitely kill their leader and win, which it happens in War Machine and Hordes. Yeah. Assassination yeah. is always a uh, always a victory. Um, and I like it because 
I really don't like the fact that, yes, in War Machine and Hordes, you can have all these really complicated, different things going on for victory conditions, and how 90% of the players just aim to kill your well, leader. It's, it's like Colin said about the games he's won, one of them was through victory conditions, mm. the rest were through assassination. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Beat, I beat you once by assassinating your leader accidentally because you tried to kill yeah. mine and, and had failed. two hit points left yeah. so I just murdered you. Yeah. <laughs> every, every, every game I've, I've actually won more games than I've lost but every game yeah. I've lost is because I've tried to assassinate somebody it's fine. and failed. Yeah, and I just feel that the game, I mean, I we, we played, I mean, I got I hadn't war game too much in the last few years. Yeah. Uh, got back into it through War Machine and Hordes uh, back in January and then yep. saw Malifaux and fell madly in love and changed what I was, yeah. uh, what I was playing. Um, played, went to a gate, local gaming club, played quite a few different people and the very serious players, players that were really into it, the players that you feel you could learn from yep. were all playing to assassinate. Yep. There was no one there really playing to, no. to do the, the objectives. And it, it warps the games, sorry? hordes and war machine. Yeah, because it's the most <laughs> easiest. It's way the easiest to, way to yeah, do it, and you you end up with quickest. these really skewed lists. Um, and there's, it feels like there's very much a thing of take this model, take this other model, take this other model. They synergize in this way, which is guaranteed because all your models activate in the same go. Yeah, at the same time, and you create this unstoppable thing, and you smash into people, and then it's oh, how do you counter this? How do you counter that? If you're into that, that's great, but I find that really dull because it makes the game really one-dimensional. It's yeah. just all about murdering that that piece that your opponent's got. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd say as as someone who runs an assassination army because um, I play Legion. Who, you are the problem, um, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Legion are a glass cannon. Assassinating yeah. is what they do. They hit really hard, but they do not win protracted wars. Um, and although I've enjoyed an awful lot of my games... It has. It starts to get boring. If I play more than say once a month, it's very quick to get boring because I go right. I'm moving here, moving there, wait doing for this. everybody to get into range. Right, charge them. Doing the same thing that you doing, always do. Yeah, because yeah. there's nothing else I can do. Now, at the higher level of play, and you, you've played tournaments and similar, yeah. you, you've gotten into into it in a much bigger way than I ever did. Um, it, it almost seems like a rock, scissors, paper thing. It is. Yeah. And it's based on your, your army selection I took, and your caster and things like that. I took part in one tournament and I was bored from the very beginning. Yeah. Because it was, we're both going to run at each other and because it is assassinating and it is a tournament, everybody's being very, very specific with their tape measurements and can I drop a piece of paper in between these models to see if they're out of range well that comes back to my original point that if you play any game with someone who's not a nice person yeah. it'll be rubbish yeah. if you're yeah. playing with someone you like generally you could make yeah but you know, I'd, I'd happily we could play Ludo now and I'm sure we'd have yeah. a good laugh yeah but if you're doing but something better. to an objective if, I mean, if you're just focusing on the assassinate, you're going to come across a lot more of that kind yeah, of it, gameplay. It seems very much skewed. The entire game is skewed towards how can I kill that enemy's one particular model really, really quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, you know, there's things out there like turn one assassination lists and things like that. Yeah. Uh, which are madness. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know whether that's a problem in the balancing or whether it's, I mean, it is quite a deep complex game it's been going for a good decade now yeah, yeah. slightly it longer now. um and such um i just i just it didn't appeal to me as a game as i've malifaux does a lot more yeah, yeah sorry. as i've got older uh with with playing war games and especially now that we're playing malifaux i am bored of just running assassinate yeah because yeah. it's not interesting and Wars, battles, campaigns don't work that way. No, you don't just go to kill a certain person. You go no. to take an objective, you know, take a certain yeah. piece of land. Yes. You go to steal something. You go to do this, plant do explosives. I mean, even <laughs> all of these I mentioned are part of Malifaux. Yes. I mean, even games such as 40k, which have objectives, I don't remember ever really paying any attention to the objectives. No. Because you just shot everybody, <laughs> yeah. and even if you were going right, we have we have these. We need to be have troops within three inches of this marker. Yeah. 
you just shot all those troops yeah, within yeah. those three inches. Well, of I that remember marker. Warhammer yeah. Fantasy used to do this. Probably doesn't now. Um, I've not really looked at it, but it just seems like it's it's a very odd game these days. Um, well, it doesn't exist. That's why. Oh, they've changed, it, haven't they? It's, yeah, it's, now it's Age, Age of, of Sigmar. Sigmar. Yes. Yeah. Which seems quite strange. Uh, I have looked at it. Yeah. But. Um, in those games, you quite often you would end up totting up victory points yeah. at the end of a game. <clears throat> now, I like nothing more after a hard-fought war game to uh, <laughs> do some accountancy, but man, just get the calculator out, literally get the calculator out, yeah, um, and work out who's won. Yeah, that sucks. Spreadsheets, the game. Yeah, it's horrible, um, and it's one of the things. I mean, Great not, if you're a tax accountant, don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah, we talked about um, games like um, Arctic Scavengers and Sheriff of Nottingham, they all require some adding up at the end of the game. Yeah. Which, again, I find quite dull. I really yeah. like the Euro games. A lot of the games will have a score tracker and you just move as you move around and you can see who's winning at any point in time. Yeah. Malifaux feels more like that. The way it works is um, you have a single strategy that's generated randomly. Yeah. yeah. And it might be that you're there to annihilate the other crew. So you'll get victory points for killing multiple models in a turn. Yeah. And these will add up and you'll see them and you'll, we use markers, but you'll know at any point who's got how many points from what. Yeah. Um, it might be, uh, taking territory and controlling territory. There's, there's, there's a selection of those. You'll yeah. then also have schemes. There will be five schemes available, again, generated randomly by flipping cards. You'll pick two out of the five and I think there's there's a good couple dozen yeah but I think there's no it's about 18 because there's one for every number in the deck one for jokers one for one for each suit and one for flipping doubles okay so you've got um, you've got yeah about 18 18 or so uh, to choose from so you've got a random selection each time having the same five up come up is fairly um Unlikely. Unlikely. And then you pick two. Some of them you will declare straight away. Some of them you will write down secretly and only reveal when the time is right. And it yeah. might be something like assassinate the other person's leader, which won't win you the game. But if you do it quick, it will give you a points. lot of victory points. Yeah. It might be, again, controlling territory. It might involve interacting with certain enemy models in a certain way. So you might get plant evidence. So you run over to the enemy leader and put something on them that then makes it look like they did something. Yeah. It might be to get one of your own models killed by a specific enemy model. Yeah. And you're going to frame them for murder. So you'll go, <gasps> look, they killed Jeff. Again, this links and, in very much with the story driven. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And they actually have another section, which we've not really got into yet, but there are other story based ones available. Yeah. Which are slightly different, which, a little bit wackier and a bit more out there. Yeah, but they also link into a campaign and have the consequences for those victory yeah, yeah, conditions being met in the next game. Yeah, they've just they've just released a campaign system, which reminds me of old Necromunda. Um, yeah. Um, which I really want to try at some point. Yeah, yeah. Half the reason why I'm building a board. Mordheim. That was the word I was looking for. <laughs> uh, those sorts of games where you've got consequences yeah. and you earn upgrades and abilities and yeah. such like as you go along. Now, the one thing I would say is you've then got... You, you get given... Before you've even started, you've been given five options yeah. on how to try and win the game. Yeah. <laughs> this... This is the problem. Yes. yes. This, yeah. this is where, yeah. Yeah. especially me and Aaron have the issue. Yeah. On paper, this, this sounds brilliant. Oh, it's I great. I love it as a mechanic because yeah. your whole team could be murdered and you could still win. Yes. Because you planted all the explosives in the right place and they yeah. can't do anything about it. Now. So it's been a suicide mission, but you've succeeded yeah. in what your faction also, needed you to do. I mean, you can actually win a game without the combat taking place. Yeah. yeah. Which might sound really <laughs> dull, but... Also sounds amazing. It's completely well, different. We could all end up sitting in opposite corners, fulfilling objectives, and not actually have a fight until the yeah. last turn. But you need yeah. to stop the other team fulfilling their objectives. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you can often guess what they're going to do by their selection. Because the other thing I really like is you generate these, these things. You then pick what you want to do, and then you build your army. Yeah. Yeah. So Which you is... pick a faction... And, but first, generate the strategies and schemes, and then go right. Yeah, I, I need to. I've got lots of killy stuff here. I'm going to take stuff that's really brutal in combat. Yeah. yeah, or you go. Oh, I need to 
plant explosives, right, I'm going to take lots of fast-moving yeah. stuff so I can do it quickly. Yeah. And that's really good because I think half the problem with objectives in other war games is you build the army first. Yeah. And when you go, well, I built my army for Hitty Hitty Punchy and they want me to run Stand over still. to the other side of the board and plant objective markers there, well, that's useless because I'm really slow but heavy hitting. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll just run at them and kill, kill their leader. Yeah. Yay, I've won. <laughs> yeah. But this is when you're playing the game... At least outside the Star Box. The Star Box introduces these things bit by bit. Yes. The last game you do introduces a simplified version of this. It, it just gives you, gives you two. two. It basically down. chooses uh, <clears throat> it chooses a strategy yeah. and a scheme two. for two. you and tells you how they two. work. You used to, yeah. yeah. Because there's so many options, because there's so many things you can do, yeah. I, yeah, it overcomplicated things a little bit. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You looked baffled. I could not wrap my head around it. Blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. In, uh, especially the last big game I played against one of our friends, um, the objectives were put points <laughs> along the centre line, the middle of the board, yeah, and also those. objectives either side. And there was this and that objective. They were all plant points yeah. across the board, and I sat in a corner and just went. I'm just going to sit here. And I lost really, really hideously bad. Yeah. Yes. Because although actually my where I was set up was really good and really defensive and he couldn't get through my wall. He ignored it and went round. He ignored it, went round, planned all the objectives and won. Yeah. And I just sat there going, I don't know what to do. Yeah. It just it gets to a point so where your brain just option. kind of goes, yeah. Uh, no, I'm just going to simplify and do this one thing. And your instinct is go back to that really simplified yeah. war hordes. I'm just going to kill their leader. Well, that's, the, that's the thing. Even though I knew that there was lots of movement and objective place things, I still went, he is going to attack me. I will set up defensively here. Um, yeah, even though I knew there was lots of movement-based objectives, I still went, he will attack me. I will set up in the corner so he cannot attack me, which was an awful, awful idea. Yeah, yeah. but... I think there's a learning curve there. You won't do that again. No. no. You won't set up behind cover if I take Von Schill because you know what he can do now. Yes. Yeah. Again, it links back into the, you know, and probably yeah. if you're both starting out for the first time. Well, I mean, me and Aaron haven't played many games. No. And although the, they, we had the objective, I think we were just going to run at one another anyway. Yeah. Just yeah. because... We're new to it, and we're used to old hobby games of... Yeah, I mean, I I actually quite like it when something like Assassinate comes up, and you may have noticed when I've played you you guys, I will take the simpler objectives, because some of them are quite complicated. Yeah. Yeah. But it's nice to know they're there, and there's a depth to it. Because you can alter and change. I I just think it's a case of... I think I... I I mean, I definitely struggle, A, to remember what I've chosen, and then B, try to remember the other ones to try and figure out what they've chosen. (laughs) And, oh my God, my brain. Now, what's quite good is, I've I've bought the cards that have them all on. Yeah. um, Which is about a tenner. um, And what I do is I lay out the cards... And then I take the ones that are mine and I flip them over and I put the other ones in a little pile next to it so I can keep checking. Yeah. I heartily recommend, I, if you're going to get into yeah. it, do mm. that because it's there in front of you. I will definitely be buying my own pack. So yeah. say we use yours for the game, I will put the four out in front of me so I can sit there constantly reading them yeah. and going, mm. oh yeah, that's the four. This, this is where it fell down a little bit for me in the previous case now the starter box counteracted this because it simplified things a lot so it brought we had it to yeah. it better we had two objectives and I won it because of the objectives oh yeah I mean which yeah. as I said to you it was like there was a couple of points where if things had gone wrong I could look back at that game and go okay because I didn't do that I should have focused more on doing that that definitely won me it yeah and vice versa things like that in the previous games I played I knew I played badly but I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was I yeah. did wrong because it was just too much for me to process initially. Yeah. Now, the more games I play of this, probably the less this is going to happen on Wood Prison. Do you want to play enough games to get your head around it? Before, it was no. It was yeah. like, I'll play it if the others are playing it, but I'm not too fussed. Now I've played the starter box, I've introduced a new, couple of new factions, I, lo- I like the way they bounced off each other that wasn't too much. Yeah. I've gone, yeah, I'd like to try it with someone else more, I want to play more yeah. another one, I want to play a bit more. It's, a, it's, it's encouraged me again. Yeah. It's something that I was kind of dead set on going, no, I'm not Do interested in. Do you always pick four? 
objectives and then choose to... Well, there's four plus one that's always available. Yeah, I mean, what sound, I'm wondering, which I always forget. What I'm wondering is whether for new players who want to try it and I'd like this for our own group, we pick two and then pick one, so we only have two objectives. Yeah, to I was going to suggest that yeah. if you're if you're starting new games, you might play a game and you just take a strategy. Yeah. yeah. And you, that's your strategy. That's how you guys are both going to win the game. There'll be a certain number of victory points available for it. Yeah. And then start to introduce the schemes a little bit slower yeah, because a, a lot of the more complicated ones as well, they involve putting down scheme markers. Yeah. So you're doing something towards the scheme. Yeah. You also then get into that bluffing situation where you might have stuff that doesn't require them, but you run someone over to a corner, corner and do one anyway. Yeah. To distract your opponent, to confuse and to make you think you're taking yeah. something else. Yeah. So there's a lot of depth to it, but it is a lot to take in. It suddenly goes, here are t- 20 different ways of winning the game. Yeah. And you go, what? Oh, yeah. So I, I would suggest your first few games, like the starter box where it had a single strategy and a single scheme. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. That worked very, 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 very well. I think, yes. but this is the problem is we started playing this game in isolation. Yes. We have no one who played this game before. Yeah. We've started as a group without anyone having played it before. Yeah. So we've learned together. Now, if we were to introduce someone new to it, I'd know exactly what to do. Yeah. But because we were learning together, we wanted to play it properly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I say properly with air quotes that you can't see because this is radio, darling. <laughs> um, but I would definitely make sure that we, we simplified that and built up. Yeah. I think once we've all played... and. I mean, I, I've played more games than you guys put together. Yeah. Um, and I've played because there's more people in the group and I tend to be the one going, I was the one going, let's play Malifaux, let's play Malifaux. Yeah. Um, once you guys have played another three or four games, I think we'll all be at the same place yeah. and we'll be yeah. happy with them I all. Think the next but game I, even I felt baffled by some of them and it's saying, yeah. plant I mean, evidence I've... and do this. And I'm going, that sounds complicated. I'll just take the easier ones. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm quite happy to play more larger games because the larger games are fun with lots of people that can do lots of different things and that all link into one another but I definitely want less strategies yeah yes. otherwise my mind is just going I'm just going to do what I did in the last game and go I'll just sit here and wait for the game to be over yeah. because I just don't know what to do now yeah. See, that's the thing with with it as well because and this is the beautiful the feel and again part of the feel the flavour and stuff of it is is all the characters are very individual yes but alright you've got your henchmen not your henchmen your minions who are you might have two or three are are the same kind of skills and abilities and stuff but each model uses a different model yeah Yeah, definitely Um, and then every step above that is a completely unique set of skills yeah, and abilities. It's actually quite it's intimidating like to step into because yes. there's so many variables. Not only do you have 20 different ways to win the game, yeah. um, but every single model has individual rules. Now, some of them are simpler than others, yeah. Yeah. but even some of the little models, like, um, for instance, your resurrectionist couldn't have canine remains. They're yeah. zombie dogs. Yeah. They're really cheap. Yeah. You can have lots of them in your army. You can even summon new ones, but they've got about three different things they can do. Yeah. Plus all of the usual things that every model can do, like walk, charge, um, interact, interact, uh, yeah. place scheme markers, do things towards the objectives, and it does become quite baffling. There's yeah. the yeah. complexity to it. I mean, it's, it's a like, lot harder um, to step into. It's I like think. my nurses. I had, I found very early, very quickly, and read and went, oh, they can cause poison. Poison causes damage. But some of my stuff, poison heals. Okay, I'll just sit them behind my models and I'll keep stabbing stuff with poison so my models keep healing and I'll just build a brick wall completely forgot the 19 different other things they can do which are absolutely amazing and interesting yeah. and when yeah. I've now played a couple of games with them and sat there and read them properly I've gone I need I to, want com- to see them do these things. I need to completely change what I'm doing because I've been using this model completely the wrong way yeah. and yeah. a very useful way but nowhere near the I could have won some of my games if I'd done yeah this this and this yeah. instead and the names of the abilities on these cards kind of really make you want to try these other things oh well. yes yeah well we we're going to move on to talking about the feel and the flavor yeah. which is actually what first appealed to me about it and is what stop not made me want to come back to it rather than just yeah. go no no bugger it. so as well as being individual unique individuals i mean not everyone has a name you, no. you will hire a guild guard or a canine remains or a gunslinger um who just is one of many yeah but the individual abilities the things on the card are all tailored 
Any particular favourites, just uh, just to illustrate what we mean? Um, well, I really liked from the starter box. Um, yeah. There's, I can't remember, Nurse something. Nurse like, Heartsbane. Nurse Heartsbane. <laughs> yeah. Um, who um, comes with what looks like a little box on the model. I was like, oh, what's that? Turn the card over, one of her attacks is Electrocute. She's got shock paddles. Shock paddles. Yeah. That she then can zap people with. They do quite a lot of damage. And then if you... You can activate special abilities depending on the suits you to flip over or yeah. cheat him. Yeah, they call it triggers. So if you... You might have... Um, if she flips a crow... Yeah. So one of the suits. They've changed the names, but there's four suits. Yeah. Uh, and they've got equivalents. So you can use normal cards, but the... Oh, it's easy, the cards it's they've got are so pretty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so she flips a crow and she can then shock them as well as do them harm and oh convulsions yeah That's it's it. called yeah. convulsions yeah. Yeah. thank you um, yeah give, give them convulsions which makes them then you can move them three inches in, in any direction away from you because it, it electrocutes them away yes and then it forces them to, uh, the other person to decide whether they want to discard a card because that that person's trying to get control over themselves or we moved another three inches away yes. because they're so badly shocked and yeah. I just like it like that yeah there's um, um, there's like there, there's we- Westrals or Wastrals Wastrals? Wastrals Wastrals yeah. who are rich noble scions of families who are kind of a bit decadent yeah um and they kind of hang out in places of disres- disrepute, spending their money and picking on poor people. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and they're all part of a... You've got sort of factions, and then you've got different groups within factions, and they're part of the black sheep. So the master, and your master is the, sort of your leader character, yeah. the master, Lucas McCabe, who's basically... A bit, he's a bit Indiana Jones. He has a whip. Yeah. Uh, he's, a bit, he's a bit dodgy, but he gets the job done. Um... He has black sheep, and he works really well with the black sheep, and they're all sort of outcasts and such yeah, like yeah. that work with the guild, but kind of also for someone else, and they're a bit dubious. Yeah, they have the swagger ability. So <laughs> when they move, because they're swaggering around, showing off and being really cocky, they become harder to hit. Yeah, um, I just always little things them, like like the. Um characters from a clockwork orange yes the groups. and they yeah. actually look a couple of the models look a little bit like those gang members yeah. you could paint them up there's one of them who's got his cane behind his yeah. uh, behind his shoulders there's another one who's leaning nonchalantly on like a pickaxe with um, one of the hats from clockwork orange on yeah, yeah. Um, and it's got yeah and it's just a, a lot of their um, a lot of their abilities like if they do a really good shot and you flip the right trigger um, they have like better could do that again yeah. Um, <laughs> so everything they've got is sort of slightly cocky, slightly arrogant, yeah, yeah. just in the name, which gives it a really great sort of feel because that's what they are as. Yeah. And it encourages, it makes you want to play them in that way. Yeah. It makes me want to just kind of swagger out into the middle of the uh, <laughs> into the middle of the battlefield and just kind of have them, yeah. you know, shooting people, showing off, pushing their luck a little bit. Yeah. I mean. I really like the. Um, I can't remember. You have to remind me the name of the character if you can remember. It's just the little child who's dreaming stuff. For the oh, the dreamer. Home. The dreamer who, who's whose teddy bear looks af- uh, looks after him during in in in, in the game in Malifaux. Who's this big hulking great nightmarish yeah. thing? Yeah, you've got the the dreamer who is a real child in the real world. No one knows where he is or which child he is. But when he goes to sleep, his consciousness travels to the other side yeah. and attracts things that it shouldn't attract. Um, so he has named his big monster, and it's a huge thing. I mean, it's about four inches high. The model, yeah, it's one of the biggest game, a, uh, biggest models in the game, and it's huge. It's full of spiky. It's loads of teeth and spikes and and horrible things. And he's named it Lord Chompy Bit <laughs> because he's an eight year old boy, and that's what he's called it. Yeah. Um, and he turns into that, and then that can turn back into him. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's got a nice. There's, there's some dark humour in there. Yeah. Uh, but things. There's just so much flavour to what's going on. You're yeah. talking about cowboys. Yes. There's, um, yeah. There's a, a, a western feel to lots a lot of, of the, the stuff because in that that era abilities are appropriately named. Yes. To that. Um, yeah. I play. I play the resurrectionists um, who are mad scientists basically they got Frankenstein monsters yeah. um, I've got McMorning who's a guild member so the, the ruling elite of the city but he moonlights um, as 
as a resurrection. Yeah, so actually there's masters that you can play in different factions yeah. and they'll play slightly differently. They'll have different things they can command and different upgrades to make them yeah. fit yeah. one I side mean, or the other. One of his abilities is called Organ Donor and it pretty much does what it says. When you damage people with your scalpel, you heal that much back because he is harvesting you and replacing himself. Yes. Um, <laughs> nurses is one of my favourite. Who um, they're they're very dodgy nurses. Uh, they want to stay young and beautiful, which McMorning does for them by replacing their damaged parts with new fresh parts. <laughs> um, so they're all been driven completely insane, and their one of their abilities is called illegible prescriptions. <laughs> uh, in which you can discard cards to add suits from other cards because it's just really dodgingly written. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it which means is, this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is absolutely amazing in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, um, and that's the thing. The feel of it. I mean, the models were what attracted me first of all. Yeah. So, um, and and everything is sort of reinforced through backstory, as we've mentioned. There's yeah, really yeah. strong backstory. So in my box now, I mean, I've got. Lots of models. Oh, lots of You've gone mad. Right? <laughs> I have gone Completely slightly mad. Um, but in my box at the moment, and I've got nowhere near all the models, no. uh, but I have a 10 foot tall teddy bear with razor sharp uh, claws <laughs> and fangs who can eat people, yeah. um, and his evil baby companion, um, <laughs> who is a typical glass canyon. He's only one foot tall. Yeah. Uh, but he also has a carving knife and like stabbing people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely the first game that the war game that I've played that instead of going, I want this faction, that's my faction. Yeah. It's one that I've looked at and gone, I want that model. Yeah. I want that model. And I yeah. want that model. Oh, well, I'll buy three factions then. Yeah. And I've got three factions because of it and yeah. some jewel for another that I'm probably going to buy. The as nice well. thing is what you can <laughs> do with this game. I mean, the games are, they are very small. Um, I've got currently, I think it's about nine models in my faction. And then I've got another four models that I use for summoning because I can summon extra models. Those nine models make up the equivalent of about a 1500 point game of 40k. So though there's a this lot... It's a typical game size. Yeah. So, uh, 35 soul stones? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a typically normal size large game. That whole thing cost me about £35. Yeah. So although you go, oh, I really like this model, mm, in other games, say 40k, you go, oh, I really like this elder model. Oh, I'm not going to buy it because that means I need to then spend £400 on an army to play it. Yeah, to it's, actually use with the rest of the stuff. Instead, yeah. you can go, I really like the little baby with... The teddy bear that follows him around, well, I could spend 35 quid and get a him and a small army. Yeah, enough and to play a game. I, can, I, yeah, I don't have to yeah. buy any more for it, but I can play a game and that... Yeah, the box with Caden is about 25 to £30, pounds and the teddy bear himself is about a tenner, maybe yeah. a little bit more. I mean, it allows... So for £40, pounds, I could play 35 yeah. But I wouldn't have the flexibility to choose different things. No, but you can play a game. I mean, I want. I decided I wanted McMorning just because he's a ginger mad scientist. <laughs> um, a bit of love for the gingers. A bit of love for the ginger mad scientist. Um, you get a hard rap for something they can't change. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> um, but nice. I, I spent £35 and, and yeah. got him. And I didn't hesitate for a moment and go yeah. well, well I also need to then spend £150 to make his army worth it it was yeah. that'll do yeah the smaller scale makes it much easier just to buy in and get something different something new yeah, mm. um, yeah I was going through all the, the weird things I had for, for feel so I've got my, my 10 foot teddy bear and his evil baby Yeah. Um, I've got a gambler who sold his soul to a demon of addiction and uh, runs a casino uh, so a lot of his, cre his creatures and things that he uses and that comes with him are either people he sold basically demon infused drugs to who are now addicts yeah. they're hollow shells of those who have been addicted to the point of death and possession um, <laughs> people that work in his casino so he's got some sort of casino girls that um, and entertainers yeah. and, and things like beckoners people that try to yeah. get people in off the street into his yeah. uh, casino who attract models towards yeah the so others. come here come here come and have a come yeah. have a look come and win something come here um, yeah. or r weird disembodied demon things that want to eat people yeah the hungering darkness um i've got a mercenary woman uh, who came to the city uh, to seek her fortune and met her doppelganger who obviously looked just like her now yeah. what doppelgangers normally do is they look like you they murder you and take your place Ooh. yeah this doppelganger decided that she liked 
the other version of her. And now you have a crew run by the Victorias. So you have Victoria and Victoria, <laughs> um, who work slightly differently. No one knows which one's the doppelganger and which one isn't. And the rumour <laughs> is that they swap over roles and equipment anyway. Yeah. Um, but they're essentially uh, literally identical twins. <laughs> um, and you hire them as a pair yeah. together. Um, and... They're absolutely amazing in close combat. Not very good elsewhere. Mm. But they have lots of synergy between them and things like that. Um, and I also have a steampunk librarian, a giant steam mecha suit, <laughs> who stomps around the, the battlefield reading from a book and casting spells at people. Yeah. Absolutely love it. It's crazy. Yeah. There's all sorts of strange things going on. It's full of flavour. Yeah. It's not, with all respect to uh, things, it's not elves in space with pointy no. hats. Um, it's got its own feel it's got its own flavour it's strongly steampunk there's a lot of horror influences yeah. um, in there and it's got kind of a quirky feel to it yeah. so I really really like it it really appealed yeah. uh, to me um, you it's have not I mean there's lots of grim dark horrible things in it, in it but there's also a lot of it's slightly light humor. I mean I have a zombie chihuahua yeah. Yes. yes. It, that is as ridiculous as it sounds. <laughs> it is a tiny zombie chihuahua that runs around the battlefield chewing on people's legs. Um and it just doesn't make it all serious or grim. Which no. is nice. I was gonna yeah. say every time I've played a game, I've always had a flip through my cards, going, Oh that's a really good ability, oh that's awesome, that model looks amazing, or this is character sounds awesome but it's always been something on the cards that's kind of made me giggle Chuckle. like the swagger is like that's awesome that's, yeah. that's so cool the beckoners and things yeah. like that it's like okay just attracting people over to then do yeah. horrible things to them it's there's always been a little bit of something in there that's made me you know, giggle inside yeah there's yeah. a there's a feel to it there's a, a flavour to it you yeah. can have it's an army of more yeah you can have an army of um, puppet people yeah. yeah tiny puppets controlled by a living puppet that yep. tells them what to do yep. uh, you can have a woman who has steampunk wings grafted onto her back who thinks she's an angel awesome. um, <laughs> yeah one of the uh, one of the um, arcanist faction yeah um, it's like that you can have um, in fact it might be worth going into some of the factions and such like um, you can have an army of you basically have a union so they're yeah. the workers who are building the um, they're the miners and steam fitters union so yes. they're the people that are building the railways they're the people that are mining the soul stones that's so important uh, you have people that are making all the the creatures or, yeah. well the, the robotic things um, and they don't want to be told what to do they want to organise for themselves so yeah. you can have uh, you can have basically a communist uprising yeah. <laughs> well communist but socialist uprising or a yeah. people's revolution yeah. um, if strike. you like yeah and they become your faction and they're within the arcanists not all the arcanists work like that yeah the same way that not all of the guild actually are on the side of the guild but they work for the guild or work with the guild yeah, yeah. Um, so you've got these different Groups within groups. You can, you can mix with, and match across faction. You can end up with faction. I mean, no army being the same. You can all play the same faction and have completely different armies. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Based on masters and the yeah. other characters I mean, you've taken. The masters quite often dictate what else you're going to take with them. Yes. So, for instance, Jacob Lynch, who's the possessed guy, well, the yeah, guy who sold yeah. his soul, he works much, much better if you take other models that work off of the same sorts of abilities. Yeah, they, they the, synergize. The possessed creatures can infect things they attack. They which, make you addicted, basically. Yeah, yeah, which then Jacob can then channel off of and use to get more cards and use special abilities and things like yeah, that, which if you've not got creatures that do that, yeah. you've kind of wasted Jacob a little bit. Yeah, and him and the beckoners can make people addicted. And then there's models that if things are addicted, they do extra damage. Yeah, and things like that. Um, but for instance, the Victorias, the two outcasts, they're really good at fighting. They work nicely with um, two or three other models mm. um, that are literally their sisters. <laughs> so they've got a couple sisters. Well, they've got a sister, and they've got a girl they adopted. So is their sister. Yeah. Uh, they've decided that she's their sister. Um, and they can all share healing and things like that. So they get bonuses. But they're only three or four models. You still need to build a faction. So you could go all in for combat, get loads of other combat stuff yeah. for the faction. Or you could balance out their combat by having some fast runners to do objectives or some shooting to hold territory. 
Yeah, uh, yeah give you some control, ball control. Armies, yeah, which you so some of the masters are more themed towards yeah. pushing you towards certain groups. Some just come with some models that work quite nicely, but yeah. you can actually yeah. pick and choose elsewhere. It's quite nice. I mean, to one of the, the um, two of the cast, one of the casters I have, and one of the other casters I want to get are completely different. I've got McMoring and uh, McMoran. McMorning. McMorning. I can yeah. never say that right. Um, <laughs> who works by killing things with poison and then turning them into his own things. So I make very little use of dead characters. I, I need a lot of poison-based yes. characters. Yeah, so you see something that dishes out poison and you I add it to it, your own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what the other character I'd like, uh, Nicodem, um, he works by using lots of corpse markers. When something dies... It turns into a corpse marker. He then uses that to heal his troops, summon more troops, and in sometimes turn them into tactical nuclear weapons and blow up other troops with, with them. Um, <laughs> Just like in real life. Yeah. Uh, so they're completely different because McMorning doesn't use corpse markers because he instantly turns what's dead into one of his own so they don't place the markers down. Yeah. So it's two entirely different armies all within one faction. Yes. Yeah. Which is nice. Keeps stops it getting boring if you're only got if 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 it's only you and a friend who are playing, the game won't be boring because it's fairly cheap yeah. to start up a new army. Yeah, and it gives it a lot of variety. Yeah. So we've mentioned the the factions. We've got the Neverborn, who are nightmares given form, the yep. native inhabitants, and quite yep. often they'll be able to interact with or completely ignore the scenery. Yeah, uh, because yeah. It, this is their home. Yes. Uh, they quite often have psychological effects. A lot of the horror comes from them. You've got the Arcanists, who are magic users, which are kind of outlawed, not supposed to yeah. use magic without permission. Uh, so you've got them, they're in like the rebel faction. Yeah. Uh, although some of them are completely different. So you've got the, the rebels, the, mind, the steam fitters and, and those people. You've also got uh, Rasputina, who is the uh, the soul of winter reborn um, and goes around freezing things and uses like ice constructs and things like that. Yep. So a completely different feel, but you could mix some of the other stuff in um, if you like. And she has lots of models that synergize with her as well, um, including one I'm waiting to come out. I've seen the model. It's so pretty, which is um, a giant Yeti creature yeah. um, with its controller. Um, who it's kind of guarding and protecting and it just looks so pretty yeah um, you've got the guild who are the humans who are in charge their intentions may be good some of them but some of them are incredibly dodgy yeah. um, they're a little bit fascist in the yeah. way they go about things they're quite unpleasant I mean I've got executioners yeah, yeah. Uh, the execution they models fill the like, Victorian capitalist role. There's, yeah, there's, 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 yeah, there's the guild of... guards who are a lot of um, shoot first, and then we'll determine yeah. whether that person was guilty the after they're dead. Almost, yeah. yeah, but they've got some idealists. They've also got like the Ortega clan who work for them, but they're basically a, a clan of cowboy gunslingers. Yeah, and they're all family. Yeah, <laughs> um, including uh, the grandma in a wheelchair with a giant um, elephant gun. Yeah, uh, who when she shoots it goes flying backwards, um, but can also hitch a lift. So anyone that moves near her, they can give her a push. Yeah. So, so she follows them around. That's awesome. Yes, yeah. See, this is the thing. The, these are rules mechanics, but they're also characterful, and yeah. this is the thing I really uh, like. Well, it was like that uh, model you showed me earlier. The chap whip on horseback thing yes, Jones yeah. on, who's got a dog and he can hand the equipment to go give it to somebody else yes. the dog can run off around the back so, and yeah. doing people stuff yeah he works for um, he works for the guild as well yeah. uh, but he's also dual faction and he's a bit dodgy yeah. um, <laughs> but he can yes he can hand off stuff to his dog Luna and Luna can take um, you can take you've got a big selection of different upgrades he can she can take a magic sword and run it over to a different model and they yeah. can use it um, or a bulletproof vest or um, other things that he, that he can pass his artifacts around it's really really nice no one else does that that's no. his thing yeah. yeah. but if that sounds like it appeals to you then you, you take him yeah. and you build your stuff around him yeah. um, you've got the resurrectionists that we've mentioned undead zombie people yeah, um, yeah and you've got um mad scientists or you've got traditional kind of necromancers yeah like. got, there's there's a couple of the traditional necromancers obsessed with not dying and so looking for, for ways of that and then you've got other characters who are just 
Dr. Frankenstein, really, who just feel like sticking some stuff together and don't understand why it's illegal. Yeah. You've got the outcasts, who are kind of a hodgepodge faction made up of mercenaries um, or people that don't quite fit in yeah. for yeah. whatever reason. Mercenaries can be hired by other people as well, but you've got people like Von Schill, who's essentially a... He, he commands the Fry Corps. Yeah, they, flamen Werfers. Yeah, oh, I love, Literally, I love my, I, I love my specialist with his flamen Werfer. <laughs> it works good flamen, it really does. I was obsessed with flamen Werfers for yes. about a week after I got that model. Uh, I, mean, I saw is, the work, I got very excited. Yeah, I was, after playing with that model, I was like, oh, he's so good. Oh, flamen is really fun. You blew him up in our game deliberately, so that he'd set things on fire. <laughs> yes, and yet he still lived <laughs> because my zombie creature was hard and refused to fall. Yes. Over. Um, you might also have, I mean, they've got people like uh, Jack Daw, uh, is it Jack Daw? I think it's Jack Daw, who was hung for a crime he did not commit, and now his spirit haunts Malifaux seeking vengeance. He has yeah. uh, creatures called the Guilty, so he's got one that's riding a lot, a, um, an electric chair, one that's hung from a noose, yeah. um, one that I think has got a weight tied to it and been drowned. Um, all these people that have been executed, he commands sort of a ghost army of wronged or vengeful spirits. Yeah. yeah. Completely different. Completely different to, yeah. to Von Schill, who's just basically, um, he uses technology, he's got a sort of German, World War One kind yeah. of feel to, yes. to his, uh, to his army. Um, you've got goblins, who are Billies. Uh, yeah they live out in the swamps <laughs> and they, they drink a lot of um scrumpy scrumpy and moonshine and moonshine and all their <laughs> bottles have xxx yes over them uh, yeah they ride pigs yeah they, they they've got that kind of that hillbilly redneck feel which kind oh, of fits with the era and, and yeah. the southern they, they way you associate cowboys with yeah, yeah i mean the story they don't tend to be in the city of malifaux no. they're more on the more dangerous outskirts that no one goes into and they live yeah. in the, the yeah. swamp well, the story areas. people are expanding out into that yes they're, they're, they're encroaching on things. their territory and they're they're fun and silly yeah they've got a catapult that fires pigs a pigapole, <laughs> yeah, the pigapole, the pig, pig, pole. pig pole. yeah, the, the pigapole, and awesome. uh, fire the pig, the pig lands, and then the pig can run around causing damage because it gets really upset yeah. that it's just been fired. <laughs> so you end up with this ammunition that lands, kills something because yeah. it's landed on it, and yeah. then continues to run around yeah. causing damage. Yeah, it's they're they're probably the most humorous of all the yeah. factions, if yeah. only because half their abilities need them to be drunk. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. they used to be they used to be outcasts in the first edition what we're talking about now probably should have said is the second edition yes. it's been going a good three years yeah I think so since yeah. they rebooted it three years I think two maybe two years yeah um, and that's when they started more with the plastics as well they, they were just coming in at the end of the first edition yeah, yeah. Um, but they've made them into their own faction and um, you can again play them completely differently there's quite a lot of the goblins they're, they're goblin versions of the other characters yeah so they've seen um for instance one of the uh one of them has seen the angelic arcanist lady and made wings of her own i've got a little rocket pack on it but <laughs> she's not very good and she can't really control where she goes <laughs> um, so they, they've got that feel a lot of them they, they've got a giant golem made out of beer barrels yeah that goes around getting everyone drunk yeah they've got some that think they're ninjas um, yeah they've got all sorts of uh, different things uh, going and they've got there. one that thinks he's a lawyer as well and he has an ability where he just walks around screaming at people which yes. stops you taking interact actions because yeah. he's just shouting at you the problem is he's not really good at his job so nothing he says is makes, makes you actually sense. do it actually makes you yeah. yeah it just distracts you as you're walking oh. around and he's going I object yeah and the uh, the final faction is the Ten Thunders who are um, an oriental styled uh, faction yes. um, who have come in and are infiltrating Malifaux so every single one of their masters can also work for a different faction yeah yeah. and they're all there in disguise so they're, they're not there as an overt force but they're spying they're gathering intelligence and yeah. they're manipulating things which is a really nice theme yes for that particular uh, that particular um, faction yeah and they have some really sort of interesting models that different play styles they manipulate a lot of the abilities and status effects as well they've just got a very different feel yeah I mean what I really like is in the um, the Crossroads expansion um, they brought in the Ten Thunders Resurrectionists 
So it's all the spirits of the dead Ten Thunders who have been killed over the years as they've tried yes. to infiltrate as an army. Um, I don't know if anybody knows or has looked at Japanese and Chinese um, mythology, but they have some of the most interesting and best spirits around. Yeah, yeah very yeah. Bit, strong very, tradition of ghosts. Uh, and all sorts similar. of yeah. fucked up looking stuff. Yeah. Um, and to put that, now introduce that as a resurrectionist faction is really interesting and got some great models coming out of it because they're all very oriental looking demons and monsters yeah. that tie in with the story because you've got the Ten Funders have come over and started yeah. spying and then as they've been killed they're turning into ghosts Be- and monsters yeah, and be- demons because Malifaux yeah. the city on the other side of the wider area yeah. is very strong magically and that kind of thing can happen yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, should we just finally? I mean, we probably should have. I think we've done this slightly backwards, and that we've explained the yeah. game side of things first. Well, I mean, it's the thing that's. Well, the game is you can love love the look of everything, yeah. but if the game's wrong, I mean, I, so. I I love the look of War Machine and Hordes. The models are so pretty. I mean, some of the yeah. the three headed Hydra creature yeah, yeah. score. Um, is this enormous thing of absolute beauty? I want to weep tears of joy over it. Yeah, but I just don't want to play the game with them. No, yeah, I'm the time. same with 40k. I could probably still recite to you the last 10,000 years of history it made. I've read all the Index Astartes and I know all the background for all 18 of the Space Marine Legions. You see two bookshelves, yeah, um, full of 40k stuff. Yeah, I, I, I know the majority of all the story, and yet it's one of the most boring games I ever played and I probably only played about 20 games throughout yeah. all of my hobby in life because I found it so boring but I love the story yeah, yeah. so talking about the gameplay is always an important it's aspect the most, yeah. Yeah. because you won't keep coming back to it you might I enjoy suppose, the mythos but you won't be invested in playing the game I suppose what most people were probably watching on computer watching listening on computers while we've been talking have been looking at the pictures looking yeah. at the models and probably decided if it's for yeah, them already yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't mind talking about the models though no I'd like to talk about the models I mean as a hobbyist I, I've always been a hobbyist first um, most of my space marine art in fact all of my space marine army was converted um, most of my war machine army despite all being made of metal is converted and I spend more time painting and building than I ever have playing um, the models are stunning in Malifaux yeah, have some of the are. most beautiful frustrating to put together I've ever seen <laughs> they are they are so pretty and it was what first attracted me to them yeah. the, the detail the detail ridiculous. of them is, is absolutely the, beautiful I mean, in, the, well. in the starter set that the the nurse is wearing a kind of long lab coat yes. in essence and She's got her arm kind of up. She's hold, uh, She's pointing, I think, a little bit. Yeah. She's got her, her arm slightly up. The coat's got a crease built into the actual model yeah. where it would have slightly folded up as she lifted her arm. Which is ridiculous. I'm, I, you know, don't bother putting that kind of little that detail. Sort, that, that level really of detail makes the that, model. Yeah, that level of detail is very hard to get onto the model. Yes. And I feel like they're ahead of the game. They are. Yeah. They are first. What I what I find quite interesting is you go on the website, you look on the boxes, you won't see a picture of the model because they're all rendered in three D and then three D printed. Yes. Yeah. Or at least the initial ones are. The initial ones mold are from there. Molded. So they just colour in the molds. That's yeah. right. They colour in the three D models. Yeah. So it looks really strange to begin with because you're like, well, what does this look like? Well, yeah. actually, it looks it exactly looks like exactly, it does on the box. Yeah. Yeah. All um, they've done is take a render of the 3D model and then just got into Photoshop and painted yeah. on there the There are a couple that are slightly different. Um, yeah. There's also, if you look, say, at the rule book, you might have the Guild Guard and it will have a picture of one of them. But actually, yeah. there's two different models, so you won't see the second yeah. one. Until I mean, some of them have yeah. pictures that don't look anything like the models, but that's because they haven't made the models yeah. yet. Um, that is the one problem when you are f- using um, 3D software to make the models, and you are only a small company. You don't have, you can't churn models out that quickly. It takes, it can take hundreds of hours to actually make a model to the detail they've done it. Yeah, and you would know, Colin, and I would know because I use the software. I'm not very good at it. Hey, you are you? You're brilliant. Give him a job. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the, the thing that really, really appealed to me was that you can get older models that are metal, but the current range is all yes. plastic. Yeah. I do not like metal models. I find them hard to put together. Um, I feel that I find them more difficult to paint 
because they they don't take the paint as well yeah. uh, sometimes, and they don't hold the paint because they're so heavy. They fall, they chip easily, they they break more easily. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've always preferred plastic models, and these ones are plastic, and they are absolutely beautiful. The level of detail on yeah, them is yeah. is great. They are, however, absolutely ridiculous to put together. They yeah. this scares me. I haven't <laughs> thought of my set myself. I haven't put them together. However, hearing Colin's tales of his chihuahua... Oh, my God. The, the chihuahua, chihuahua is half an inch tall. How many pieces was this half an inch tall chihuahua? Is it even half an inch? Not even that. It is... No, you you would have to measure in millimetres. Yeah. I think it's about... point. I think it's about four millimetres high. It's so really it's, high to... a. Uh, 32 mil model yes um, and it came in seven pieces <laughs> the body came in the body with with the head came in two halves stuck that together the zombie chihuahua has a hand hanging out of its mouth that it's chewed off um, you have to glue that on via the finger finger on the hand and this is only a normal person's hand and you got to yeah. get it into its <laughs> mouth um, and then all four of its arms and legs come on separately and its tail which is made of bone with no flesh on it whatsoever has to be glued on separately so it's thin and tiny and uh, my hands were shaking like i've never been shaking before it, it looked we like i was having earlier. some kind of fit because i was so terrified of dropping these yeah. very gray plastic pieces of, of plastic onto my very neutral colored carpet because i would <laughs> never ever see them again no. Um, but they look stunning once they are together. Once yeah. every fit, yeah. I mean, some of the models as well. You look at the pieces and go, "What? Where the <laughs> hell is that supposed yeah. to go?" Because it's not simply body, legs, arms. Um, one of the models I've got, um, whose name I can't remember, uh, the Betty Noir, um, who's a spirit that jumps out of dead things. Um, sh her face comes separately from the back of her head yes her hair then comes separately and her fringe comes separately <laughs> and I was staring at the model as I was building it and going right I'll use this bit next but I couldn't figure out yeah. where it went until finally I put the hair on and went oh there's a gap oh that's what that's yeah. for <laughs> now it, they're quite good in that they're, they're, the models are grooved or notched once you find the right place, they fit very snugly. Yes. I have accidentally filed off thinking they were sort of mould lines, some of the bits that clip things in place. <laughs> yeah. Which is then, so I've not got like a little the little wedge to put things in. Um, yeah. And I de live again desperately in fear of chopping bits. I've just put together a strong arm suit. So it's a basically a power armoured guy but in a steampunk world war one kind of feel so he's got a giant barrel on his back and pneumatic steam fists at the front yeah and it comes with four very very fine wires that connect from the the barrel to his fists to power it looks really really nice and they fit absolutely perfectly if you get everything right then they just slot on mm. even though they're a good couple inches of um plastic you would expect they're not even a millimeter out they fit perfectly when you get it get it right but i cut one of the wires off and it snapped in half because it was so thin yeah at which point it doesn't fit and i hadn't had a chance to get it in like and it was and i had to glue it back together so i had to kind of hold it get it in, in the right place put some super glue on it to hold it in the right bit then leave it until it was fairly solid and then try and stick it on and it yeah. broke and i had to do it again and it was quite a painful operation yeah. um a couple of i mean the, um the steam trunk model from von schill's set it's it's basically a steampunk version of the luggage from Discworld. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it opens up it dispenses good things uh, to nearby friendly creatures or fa friendly models, and it drives around on its own. It's it's got it's getting its own sentience. Um, it's very very cool. It comes on a thirty mil base, and it was over twenty pieces to put together. Yeah, and it uh, was it was it was mad. A couple of other of their models, I I can definitely tell the d development team between the rules and the sculptors. There is no communication, as one of the models that our friend had, which was kind of this mechanical spider being with a torso on top, um, didn't fit on the base. It, it yeah. literally, does, you have to overlap it mm -hmm. on the base and glue it on the inside edges to get it to stay, 
which is it's got because of mate, it's a beautiful model, but they haven't designed it around with the right base, base size. Yeah. yeah, you have different base sizes for different models. Yeah, I mean 30, 40, 50. So yeah. They think, might have been expecting it to be on a bigger base. Yeah, I mean, there's also... It would look better on a bigger base, there, but there it is, changes its feel in the game. Yeah. I mean, there also is, there's definitely problems between the sizing, because you get different sizes of models that work with different terrain. So, for example, a standard height building will be height 3, which means it covers a height 3, height 2, and a height 1 model. And then you'll have a bush, say, that covers height 1. So if your My Zombie Chihuahua is height 1... It's, it's, tiny, it's hidden, yeah. it can't be seen behind the bush. Height 2, you might get cover, but you can get shot. And then height 3, the bush is useless, it can't yeah, really big all. stuff is height 3. But when you've got models that are the same height, but don't match up... Oh, you're talking about Sebastian, aren't you? Yeah. Who is... You can't uh, see this over Look, the, morning's the, assistant. Yeah. Um, he's... Kind of hunched over. Those uh, you can't see this internet, um, but I've got two models in front of me: Sebastian and a zombie Chihuahua. One is uh, about an inch and a half tall. The zombie Chihuahua is about point uh, is about four millimeters high, and yet in the game rules, they're the same height. They're both what? height one. <laughs> I was going to thought you were going to say that's height two, and he's hunched over, so it's not quite fitting. But no, they no. are both height one. Okay. So it is, it is, they get the same level of cover. The Chihuahua is probably about the same size as your little fingernail. <laughs> yes, the yeah, yeah actually, the yeah. proper model is probably about the size of your the other model. Uh, the assistant is about the size of your thumb, not your thumbnail, but your thumb yeah, itself. Thumb itself yeah. yeah, and they're, that's they're, ridiculous. Yeah. Again, that's another <coughs> the rule. People writing the rules and the people sculpting the models yes. are haven't got yeah. the, quite the right communication. I wouldn't want to try putting that together as a one. What, as an I actual would, equivalent? Yeah, I mean, what they've over. done with, say, Sebastian. Sebastian I mean, is hunched. <laughs> um, Sebastian is a is a hunchback. Yeah, he's meant game. to be eagle. Yeah, so the he's, he's essentially system. eagle. Yeah. So they've so got they him, made as, him shorter. Yeah, yeah, they made him in the rules. He's only height one because most human beings are height tall. So it makes sense that he's height one. But then when you start putting models together, you go, well, that doesn't work yeah. at all. But they're both really nice models. Yes. Oh, they're stunning models. So I'm willing to forgive when things look that pretty. A big part oh, of yeah, the wargaming yeah. hobby yes. is collecting, painting, having pretty things. Yeah. I mean, uh, this, yeah. This, is, this is also where when you're playing a game with friends and going, okay, this, this half an inch is, is, we'll say, well, we'll say this inch wall is height one. The fact that my model sticks over that wall, you just have to... Well, this is exactly what happened when I played you. I yeah. went, I'm going to shoot him, and you went, no, you're not, he's, he's height one. And I went, what? Yes, yeah, not off. So you just have to um, make sure that before the game begins, you set out the heights of your terrain. Yeah, so which it tells you to do. Yeah, yeah, which, so that there, there are no arguments. What's Agreed this, what's this, on, yeah. On things, um, yeah. yeah. Which could be abused by power gaming people, but yeah. wanting certain things in there, but... You know, screw those people. Play games, have fun. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. So, I do we do we recommend Malifaux if you're after a war game? We or you're tempted to get involved in that kind of thing. From a beginner's point of view, if you are with other beginners, you have a gaming, you have gaming friends, or you go to a gaming group and and you want to introduce it. Brilliant, absolutely perfect. You can all learn together. You're all pick it up slowly. Amazing, especially with the start set now. If yeah. you are by yourself and you decide to join a gaming group that already plays Malifaux, it's going to be an absolute pain in the ass to learn because everyone is going to know what they're doing and will yeah. beat you over yeah. the head with the rules to but death. But you need you need that person to to hold your hand and show you how to. Yes, you, you need to find. Thing. And this is the thing I've never understood: people that will introduce someone to something that they like and then use that as an excuse to beat someone up. Give them a really bad gaming experience, and, and they go, "Yeah, I again. beat the new guy." Yeah, uh, yeah. Those, those people are horrible. Yeah. I, I've I've seen it happen. I've read about it. I yeah. I, I've, I would also I've, say yeah. it's those def- people suck. Yeah, I would also definitely say it's more of a game for teenagers rather than. I mean, forty k. I've seen six, seven year olds play. Yeah, you and keep out the really dark stuff. From the mod well, it's, it's the not that, but the rules aren't that complicated. Yeah, that's true. If you're a seven, yeah. you can move models six inches. You can fire guns in this inch because yeah, you're just well, rolling dice, and it's all fairly simple. I would not give a seven year old Malifaux to play just oh, because. Well, it, yeah. 
they they could learn, they could to. they could do that. A they break the models definitely um, because yeah. they are so delicate, and B they're just not going to understand. Yeah, I mean I barely understand, and I'm nearly thirty. But we are man children, and we are man children. <laughs> oh, yes. But I, from a yes, as I would definitely recommend it. Just make sure that you've got friends who want to learn it with you. And yeah. it's not something to introduce to your five-year-old cousin. Yeah, but I, I would say that just take it easy, yeah. introduce Don't the strategies and schemes, and be prepared for some of the models to be tricky. Yeah. If you've never put together models before, if you've never, if you're not um, skilled in that area at all, uh, I would say make sure you keep away from it because it's you will you will get frustrated. They yes, yeah. they're they're not expensive in the in the fa- in the sense that all war games cost a lot of money yeah uh, but they are they you know they do cost a, they do cost a lot of money in the grand scheme of life yeah, yeah. um and therefore you know, to have something that that breaks on you or you can't stick together because yeah. it, it's so delicate um would just be a colossal waste of time, time money yeah. and would frustrate you and put you off so i would say just be prepared for uh, prepared for that yeah. I wouldn't recommend it for beginning no. modellers uh, because some of the bits are so I mean, very very tricky put to, it in uh, to put together um, I put a lot of models together over the years and oh, cut yes. them up and repositioned them it oh, took your, me sorry your conversions and stuff are amazing yeah, have you got any up on your Instagram no Colin's going to put some on his Instagram and we'll link across to it oh, yeah. okay um, <laughs> yeah. Instagram or Tumblr Instagram Instagram I, I, um, they're both things that so I, I'd probably use. say in our little group I am the most competent model maker here oh yeah putting nine models together took me five hours yeah I, I could put an entire 40k army together in that time yes it's, it's very very delicate work yeah but what I would say if you've got a really good modeler in your group so yeah. we have Colin Drop us some pennies. Yeah, drop it. <laughs> yeah, but buy, buy him a beer, buy him an energy drink, buy him a... I do like energy drinks. Whatever drink. it is that they need bribing with. Passion fruit. Passion fruit. Oh, we had delicious passion fruit. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was good. It was. It was. Don't well, lick them. Massively. <laughs> no. What was it like when you licked the inside of a passion fruit? Oh, you know when you eat a tangy piece of fruit and you're just not expecting it it makes your mouth explode yeah yeah it was like that so eating a tangy fruit was like eating a tangy <laughs> fruit yeah great story Colin I'm really glad you're here well I wasn't expecting it because normally you have to eat it to get that this was just you never it. licked a lemon no am I, have I missed out on something well I mean that has the same reaction oh, okay. like a lemon. It probably, there you go it was lemon. like licking a lemon yeah it was they are quite sharp this is all rubbish it is it's it irrelevant is. nonsense passion fruit etiquette Aaron being the one who's probably the least war game experienced yes. of us yeah. uh, what are your feelings on Malifaux I'm more inclined to play more of it now I've yeah. played the Star Box yeah. previous to this when I just jumped into the other games it was just too complex for me I loved all the individual mechanics and models were absolutely stunning you know I'd love to get them just, just something on the shelf yeah but I couldn't cope with the gameplay because it was just too much for me to manage however I now I've played the starter set and been introduced to all these bits a little bit slower I've got actually these mechanics that I can see was amazing I can understand them more and I could put them to better use and yeah I think if you take it a little step at a time I'd, I'd, I'd definitely recommend it I'd, yeah I'd like to play more and I promise Excellent. we won't do what we did with War Machine which is introduce you to the game get you yeah, to buy a whole army nearly 100 pounds and then go no, no, and bored. then not play it anymore <laughs> I don't think I could feel, feel the War Machine army now <laughs> I, I became so disillusioned with it so very quickly oh, I could always flog the models off and uh, buy Malifaux ones instead that's oh, what you did. I feel really guilty now. <laughs> I have become the avatar of regret. <laughs> and on that note, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, um, or funny things to say about what we've talked about, uh, if you've got anything you'd like us to cover in future, or if you'd just like to poke fun at Colin, uh, 
on the next to our SoundCloud, you'll find lots of different ways of getting in contact with yeah, us. Yeah. Um, so please do. We like to hear from you. The the couple of times it's happened have been uh, some of the, the best moments we've had so far since Bob died, I think. Um, so thank you very much. I've been Brian Ennis. I've been Aaron Vinci. And I've been Colin Howard. And hopefully by this time next week, we'll have escaped back through the breach, yeah. uh, laden down with precious soul stones, uh, which we'll have used to buy a new game a new video game a new board game some more war games that we will talk to you about thank you bye Bye. goodbye